Hello everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, Virginia, or UUCA as we call it for short. My name is Karen Tripp and this year I'm serving as the recording secretary for your board of trustees. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Whether you're joining us for the first time or have been a member for years, welcome. We are a community of many different backgrounds, experiences, and voices, and we welcome all with open hearts. Bring your whole self and join us just as you are. We cannot welcome you into our beautiful sanctuary right now, so we cannot talk in person, but please do join us in a virtual coffee hour over Zoom after the service. You can find the link in the Connections newsletter, uh, and it will also be noted on the Facebook page. These are difficult times, and part of being a community is supporting one another in our sorrows as well as sharing in our joys. Please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know how you are doing. You can contact the pastoral care team by email send a message to pastoralcare at uucava.org. If you are new and would like more information about us, please send an email to newcomer at uucava.org. And do check out our website at uucava.org to learn about the myriad activities and ways to connect which are happening every day albeit online for now. Again, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. And please do join us after the service for our virtual coffee hour. I hope to see you there. We call you to worship today with these words adapted from Richard Kite, a white professor of ethics at Viterbo University in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We gather today across space and in difficult times because the world needs competent, dedicated, responsible people more than ever. Even more than that, the world needs people of compassion, people who are formed by love and willing to invest that love in the well being of others. Love encourages us to take responsibility for those around us and to become a larger, more substantial presence in the world. Love dispels our fears and makes us bold. Love calls us into life, whatever the future holds. We now invite you to join us in lighting the chalice. We gather together as a community of hope to celebrate life and its infinite possibilities for love. We light this chalice as a symbol of the light within every human heart. May our individual sparks meet and merge, bringing both light and warmth to the world.
Thank you, David, Mary, and Sophia for that beautiful music. We all know that there are things that are difficult and disappointing about our virtual life, particularly how much we miss worshiping in one space together. And at the same time, sometimes there are opportunities in that virtual life, opportunities that wouldn't come to pass otherwise. We had one such last Sunday as we watched the Side with Love service created by the Unitarian Universalist Association, right alongside thousands of our UU siblings across the country. We have another such opportunity this Sunday as we welcome to our pulpit a guest preacher who probably wouldn't be able to make the trek from California for a Sunday morning were we meeting in person. Reverend Teresa Soto serves as lead minister at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland, California. I have admired their work for some years, mostly online with their wonderful Facebook presence and through the publication of their book, Spilling the Light, a book of poetry and reflections that was so popular when it came out um, that the print edition sold out. You can still get it on Kindle, and I know many of us are hoping for a reprint. In addition to the call to worship and the sermon that Reverend Soto is offering to us this morning, they are also sharing their interim director of religious education with us, Alex Hader Winnett. Alex will offer a time for all ages for us, one that was offered at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland prior, and that Reverend Soto thought would be just right for our morning together. I'm so grateful to be welcoming both Reverend Teresa and Alex to our worship this morning. And as always, I'm so grateful to be here with you. Hello, beloveds. This is your director of religious education, Alex, with our Time for All Ages, where our leaders of all ages are welcome to reflect on our story for today. So this month, we at UU Oakland are talking about white exceptionalism. White exceptionalism is a school of thought in white supremacy culture where we talk about uh, the good people and the bad people, and, and that we, as good white liberals, are, are on the, the good side because we know how to say the right words and, and do the right things, uh, and that we get to claim some sort of allyship for it. But uh, there's a lot to break down in that idea. And, and we thought it would be good to start by talking about what white supremacy is. So I have this book. It's called Not My Idea. Uh, it's a book about whiteness written and illustrated by Anastasia Higginbotham. And it's a, a really beautiful book uh, made with collages and uh, thoughtful words. So it's kind of long, I'm just going to read a portion of it, but I invite you to find a copy uh, at the library or local bookstore. When grown-ups try to hide scary things from kids, it's usually because they're scared too. They want to bury the truth. They may say, our family is kind to everyone, and we don't see color. But deep down, we all know color matters. Skin color makes a difference in how the world sees you and how you see the world. So here we have a white family walking into a store. It makes a difference in how much trouble seems to find you or let you be. 
And so here in the store, we have a security guard noticing a black child, but ignoring the white child. In stores, in cars, on sidewalks, at school, your skin color affects the most ordinary daily experiences, including which neighborhoods welcome you. So here's a nice suburban town with a fancy car. You may get the message that racism is happening only to black and brown people. Racism is a white person's problem, and we are all caught up in it. Mostly by refusing to look at it. You can face this. Understanding the truth takes courage, especially a painful truth about your own people, your own family. Even people you love may behave in ways that show they think they are the good ones. Here's oh, the, the white mom locking the door as she wa sees a black family walk by. Racism was not your idea. You don't have to defend it. You can bring your curiosity to learn about it and see that it is true. Many white people did things they never should have done, denied opportunity, denied housing, denied voting rights, and many other white people failed to see the problem with this. These choices put wealth and power into white hands, homes, and neighborhoods. Some white people join the leaders of black liberation. Now, liberation is just a big fancy word for love and freedom. And here's, here's some photos of some liberation fighters. Racism is still happening. It keeps changing and being the same. And yet, just by being here, alive in this moment, you have a chance to care about this, to connect. But connecting means opening, and opening sometimes feels like breaking. So that's where I'm going to leave it off. There's a bit more to this book. There's a, a story that is part of it. And there's some activities in the back to reflect on. So I encourage you to check it out. One of my favorite lines is that white supremacy is pretend, but the consequences are real. Keep doing good work. Keep taking care of yourselves and each other. Make good choices. Friends, we gather in our learning together and we gather in our sharing together, our sharing of our deepest joys and sorrows. I invite you during this time of prayer and meditation to lift up names or situations that you are holding in your heart, to share them in the chat if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, to send them to you, you to pastoral care at uucava.org if you'd like to be connected with someone uh, on the ministry team or with our wonderful lay pastoral care associates. 
to share them with each other. Give a call and let someone know that you're thinking of them, that you're wanting to stay connected. I know many of us are thinking of family and friends in Texas and other parts of the South who are facing severe weather and power outages this past week. Many of us may be thinking of those who are sick with COVID or otherwise, or perhaps unable to be together with worried family or with grieving family if they have lost someone dear to them. And perhaps we are also thinking that spring may yet come in this quiet, wintry time. This past week, the Christian world began its observance of Lent, 40 days of noticing, of giving up so that we may be fully present. At UUCA, we are observing UU Lent, an invitation into noticing. Each day, a word is shared, and you are invited to share a photograph that comes to mind for you, to notice around you. In the end, I think prayer, meditation, all of them are a kind of noticing. Noticing the world being bigger than we sometimes imagine it is. Noticing our connection to each other and to the divine. Noticing our place in it all. Whether you join us in taking a picture through this time, whether like me, you sometimes light a candle of noticing and remembering However you mark the noticing in your life, I hope you have the time to do it, perhaps right now. Spirit of life and love, God of many names and beyond our naming, help us notice. Help us notice when love appears. Help us notice where hope might lie. Help us notice when injustice is there. Help us notice how we might act. Help us notice each other and ourselves. Our simple prayer to notice. May it be so. Amen.
I will be reading a passage called I Pledge Allegiance to the Blue Shoes Girl by Gordon Atkinson. I pledged allegiance to a little girl in blue shoes yesterday. We all did. The crossing guard shot off the curb with her whistle in her mouth and her white gloves and her nouveau authority. All the cars stopped for one little girl with blue shoes who was a little late for school. She had no idea that all those cars were waiting on her. She stepped off the curb with exaggerated caution, like she was sticking her toe in cold water. Halfway across, something on the ground caught her eye, and she bent over to look at it. The crossing guard had to beep her whistle and give her head a little jerk to keep the little girl moving. And then, I swear, she used three different walks to get to the other side. There was a skippy little pony walk, a bunny hop or two, and finally some kind of slap happy thing that I'm sure is from a Bugs Bunny cartoon. There was a flash of blue and a backpack slapping on a tiny bottom and then she was gone. Little blue shoes girl, you do not know who you are. But we know, and we are struck dumb. We can only stare through parted waters as you dance your way across the Jordan. Did you know that we have a law for you? We made a law so that on our worst days, we would not forget. Even on the days when we think being at work on time is more important then little girls in blue shoes, a woman with gloves and a whistle will stop us and make us remember who you are. Some of us say there is something eternal about you, something we all call a soul. We don't exactly know what we mean by that. It might be our way of saying you are 1100 infinity good. But if there is anything eternal in you, any scent of the creator lying soft on the back of your neck, then you are worth more than all the gold and all the mountains and all the world. Some of us do not believe in souls and do not throw words like eternal around carelessly. But we can't deny you are the most amazing thing we have ever seen. In all our searching and in throwing, the best we have at looking deep and far, you, pausing in the street to examine whatever it was that interested you in the rarest, is the rarest mystery of all. We've only seen this once, and it's right here at home right here in your little heart. No one knows what you will be when you grow up. You may be a force for good in this world, or you may bring great evil upon us. You have the power. You have the choices. And this is why we stop and stare. But whatever you do, or whatever is done to you on November 13th of 2003 you were the little girl in blue shoes who carried unthinkable goodness across that street no one is able to take that away from Hi, my name is Reverend Teresa Soto. I'm so glad to be here with you today. Let's just take a moment. Arrive in the room, relax your face. I come to you with gratitude and with joy. Arthur Robert Ash Jr. is known to us as Arthur Ash. He is the only black man ever to win the singles title 
at Wimbledon, the US Open, and the Australian Open. Ash has this to say, which will help us as we explore love and tennis today. You've got to get to the stage in life where going for it is more important than winning or losing. This is a helpful starting place because we live in times when winning and losing are the center of a lot of conversations. White American Reformed theologian Reinhold Niebuhr offers framework on the subject. Nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, we are saved by hope. Love is such a widely used word that it applies to everything from sweethearts to Detroit pizza. Sometimes that makes people inclined to say that this means less. But I wonder if that's what happens when we get tired of trying to fit the pieces together and make sense of them. How is tennis like love and love like tennis? One thing I want you to know or to remember about tennis today is that love means zero or no points. And one thing you may know about love, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. This means that one of the things we can do is keep a record of the right things that people do. In fact, a practice like this relates to some of the advice that we could get on relationships. Doctors John and Julie Gottman teach that the health of relationships, the state of our love, depends on something that is completely possible for us to understand. Small things often, including affirmation and appreciation. As a congregation, you identify commitments like mutual respect, promoting love, reason, compassion, and activism, and even working to build a more just and peaceful world. This is work that as Niebuhr reflected, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, we are saved by hope. I'm going to practice a small thing right here, right now, and say, wow, that's wonderful. It's beautiful. I'm really very appreciative that you are the ones working on that vision right now where you are. We are called, each and all of us, and our movement at large, to this kind of active love and an even greater love that we can call interdependence. We as a movement and you as a community. Reverend Victoria Safford reflects that theologian Rebe Rebecca Parker calls covenant freely chosen and life-sustaining interdependence. The central question for us is not, what do we believe? But more, what do we believe in? To what larger love, to what people, principles, values, and dreams shall we be committed? To whom, to what are we accountable? What and how do we believe? This is a live question in Unitarian Universalism right now. Can we love black folks, indigenous folks, and people of color without resisting and rejecting racism? Will you switch sports with me for a second? Let's talk about soccer. Abby Wambach is a soccer icon, speaker, New York Times bestselling author, and activist for equality and inclusion. Abby is a two-time Olympic gold medalist and FIFA World Cup champion. After winning the Women's World Cup in 2015, Abby retired as one of the most dominant players in the history of women's soccer. In her book, Wolfpack, how to come together, unleash our power, and change the game, Abby tells this story. Recently, on a call with a company hiring me to teach about leadership, a man said, excuse me, Abby, I need 
to ensure that what you present is just applicable to men too? I said, good question. But only if you've asked every male speaker you've ever hired if the message they present is applicable to women too. Women have had to find themselves within the context presented from the male perspective forever. It is essential to flip this and allow men the opportunity to find themselves within context presented from a women's perspective. Abby Wambach illustrates something important for us today as we talk about active love, who we love and how we love. You see, on a very foundational level, you understand that people of color confront, encounter, and must deal with racism and discrimination related to skin color and ethnicity. From whom? From where? Somewhere out there? The problem with racism and internalized racism is that these two things come with us. So it's unhelpful, verging on obstructive, if people refuse opportunities to grow because they feel bad that they haven't grown yet. You see the problem there, right? How say you? Let us, O oh my dove, let us be unashamed of soul. As earth flies bare to heaven above, how is it under our control to love or not to love? Let us, white English poet Robert Browning urges, let us be unashamed of soul. Unitarian Universalists struggle with the idea that our human lives are not only lived in our minds, but also in our bodies, also in our spirits, whether you call them spirit, soul, or heart. It is clear that our minds are always at work. It is clear that in our communities, that our bodies are the bodies that we have. They are not a sight of shame. Indian poet Amina Aziz puts it this way in her poem, Home. Your body is your first and last home and your only permanent abode. Neither is your soul a location for shame. Part of anti-racist work is to clean up our past, but also it is the opportunity to embrace a future of equity, reflecting on the role of telling the truth about our practice and interconnectedness. Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, a white woman minister who is the ninth president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, offers this insight. We love to celebrate when we are on the right side of history when we let our faith and commitment to human dignity and commitment to universalism lead us into the practice of justice. But that is not the whole story, and it is important to be honest about our complicated history, not to bring shame or guilt, but to bring understanding. And that can inform our faith today not to bring shame or guilt, but to bring understanding. You are not a bad human when you are learning. You are not the wrong kind of human when you make a mistake. But also, let's be honest, whether or not you choose to be anti-racist, whether or not you choose to talk with people who care about you about these important questions and subjects, doesn't have that much to do with being good or bad, a hero or a villain. That is too simple. And actually elementary compared to the way that you already pay attention to nuance regarding other subjects. Being anti-racist is not about heroes or villains because it is about something else. Leila Saad, the author of White Supremacy and Me, offers this clarification. There is no good or bad. This isn't about your inherent goodness as a person. We're talking about the ways you're unaware of causing harm to other people because you're not aware. And so that's what we're bringing 
into the light. You're going to have to redefine good, Sa'ad says. What does it mean to you to be good? Is it that everyone else thinks you're not racist? The work is digging in and looking at how you treat black people, your staff, your customers, your clients. What policies do you have in place, whether written policies or unofficial policies that show us black lives don't matter here? But for us, it's not only staff and customers, we must also consider friends, neighbors, kin, and strangers. There are ways that may be small and unintentional, or there may be larger ways that are not exactly accidental, but instead careless, that allow people to live into the idea that black lives don't actually matter. I wanted to be able to tell you the most important thing I could about the antidote for this opting out, the medicine for exceptionalism, to allow a more just, a stronger and more loving community that we ourselves create with our actions and relationships. We're all here because someone told us about their practice or they gave us a book or they read us a poem. For some of you, it's your parents who introduced you to Unitarian Universalism or Google or a funny internet quiz that told you what percent of Unitarian Universalist you are. We're here because of conversations we've had, people who reached out to help us, people we've reached out to help. We're here because of relationships, encounters, connection. This moment is a confluence of all of that. And so it's true that at times we might feel so alone and so apart. But the truth is also that our lives are embedded in a greater fabric. That's the true context of our lives at every moment. Just as the executive in her meeting asked Abby Wambach if her presentation would be applicable to men too, you may sometimes wonder if racial justice applies to you. This work is not whether you're a hero or villain, but it is about digging in. Our lives are embedded in a greater fabric that is woven with the threads of our individual lives. What happens if we pull one thread out of the fabric? There will be a hole. You are needed. All of us need all of us to make it. If you opt out of the work of racial justice, this community will not reach its highest potential. But what is also true is that neither will you. The message of creating a world in which people always treat each other as equals is not just for black folks, indigenous folks, and people of color to work incessantly to be treated as equal to white people. Rather, it is digging in to realize that what black folks, indigenous folks, and people of color bring to community is integral to the fabric of a world in which everyone belongs and everyone receives love. You are givers of active love. You have a mission greater than personal opinion or even personal discomfort. You have the possibility of living into a larger love, a larger peace, and a larger justice. Not one which is good for black folks, indigenous folks, and people of color as though it is granted by the dominant culture, but an embodiment of interconnectedness that brings your values and mission to life. Arthur, Ash, Arthur Ashe reminds us I have tried to keep on with my striving because this is the only hope I have of ever achieving anything worthwhile and lasting. May it be so. Let us see to it.
According to research by So Young Park, generous decisions engage the temporal parietal junction. Importantly, striatal activity during generous decisions is directly related to changes in happiness. Generous giving makes you happy, and brain science people proved it. We invite you to stimulate connectivity between your temporoparietal junction and your ventral striatum, thereby increasing neurotransmitter levels associated with happiness. Give generously. It will make us all happy. We promise. Reverend Teresa, thank you so much for the reminder about how good it feels when we are generous. I have felt that. And friends, this is your chance to feel it too. We hope that if you are able to give today, that you will do so. And we have many options to give. You can mail a check to the church. You can visit our website and click on the donate button on the top right. You can use the mobile app Give Plus and use our zip code to search for us. Or you can text an amount to the number listed on your screen. At UUCA, we say this blessing. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. Let us be grateful even for our needs so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Today, I invite you to be not just grateful, but joyful in your giving, to feel the happy buzz of being able to give to something that you care about. It is indeed a privilege and a joy. Thank you for your generosity today. Love will guide us. Love will guide us through the learning, through the mistakes, through the sharing, through the difficult times. Not the kind of love that counts up wrongs, but the kind of love that counts up rights. Love will guide us. May it be true for you this week, this day, this hour, May it be true for all of us, and may we follow where love leads. May it be so.